In my most recent video on the Parasound ZP3 stereo preamplifier, I mentioned that I was driving one of its inputs from an auxiliary line level uh, attenuator booster unit, uh, which I have next to my easy chair in my home theater. And I decided to do a brief video about that just as sort of a follow up. Here's a uh, picture of the unit. This is quite a common unit sold by a lot of sellers sometimes with different silk screening on it, but as far as I can tell, it's the same unit. Uh, it has uh, just a simple level knob and a place to plug in a auxiliary input, such as from an MP3 player. So this product here, um, this is an Amazon listing for it. It's still being sold. And it looks just like the front of the two I have. And to me that looks like either TEC or JEC or JEL or TEL. Um, those letters are not shown more clearly anywhere. And some of these products that I've seen do not list the TC780LC, but most of them do. I think most of the companies that make these, if it is more than one company, are using the same silk screens. But here on this Amazon listing it says it's TCC. And it does mention the TC780LC. Apparently you can get it in more than one color. Uh, this one is black and they call it a stereo line level preamp slash booster. With an iPod jack includes optional premium high power AC adapter. And then if you look in the questions and answers the seller says this premium high power AC adapter is there because some people or many people believe that that makes it sound better. And again that's just people who think they're audiophiles and some people who know better would call them audio fools but um, I'm kind of an audiophile myself in the sense that I do appreciate good equipment with good specifications but a lot of people go way overboard and believe the most ridiculous things. Now, I've done the math on this thing and it is high fidelity but you know its specifications aren't that stellar. And anyway there's no reason why this thing needs a high power power supply or AC adapter. It's a joke. Anyway um, so I just thought I would show that listing if you're interested in something like this you can buy them. Fifty nine dollars um, essentially fifty nine fifty from Amazon maybe somewhat different prices elsewhere regarding that aux slash mp3 jack on the front panel there's a silk screened note on the rear and it says when front aux mp3 socket is plugged sort of odd English there the aux input will be disconnected and what they mean is that the RCA and DIN connectors on the back will be disconnected uh, not the aux input so that's kind of messed up and so here's an overview of the rear panel we have the inputs on the left and the outputs on the right uh, when they say parallel input I think they're just referring to the fact that the RCA jacks and the DIN jack in the input section are electrically paralleled or connected in parallel electrically and then the same thing applies to the RCA jacks and the DIN jack on the output section. It's all line level stuff and it's stereo nothing more than that and then at the right we have the uh, small barrel connector small barrel jack for the uh, DC 12 volt um, wall ward I would call it a power adapter of which both models I have of this or both examples have different power adapters and here's just a closer look at the uh, input section with its left and right RCA's and its DIN connector note that um, the RCA jacks and in fact the DIN connectors and the aux connector on the front are all electrically isolated from the chassis. They don't connect at the chassis. 
although the chassis is connected at a single ground point with the circuit ground. All right, let's take a look at the inside. There are two circuit boards, the main board and then a sub-circuit board, which just holds the um, aux jack. It ends up being at a different level. I keep thinking they could have saved themselves some money if they just punched the hole in the front panel a little higher up so that uh, <laughs> they could have just used the one circuit board. But then it probably would have had some other complications. Anyway, um, you can clearly see the uh, input and output connectors along the rear, which is at the top of this image. The volume control is over at the lower right. And then the uh, left-hand side of the circuit board in this view has the single dual op-amp IC and the surrounding components to provide the preamplification function. The circuit board is actually only held in with one screw. And besides that, uh, both of the DIN connectors uh, have, well, not the DIN connectors, but the, the connector blocks that have the RCA jacks on them each have one screw going into the rear of the chassis. So in that sense, the circuit board's held in with two screws to the rear of the chassis and one screw to the bottom of the chassis. There is also um, provision for uh, two screws to go into the sub-circuit board, and those are indeed used to hold that one in place. Also visible in this view is the green wire, which is soldered from a hole in the circuit board, uh, which is on one of the traces for the circuit ground, and then it's just tack soldered to a place on the bottom of the chassis where the paint has been scraped off. It's a tin lead solder trying to hold it to what is apparently a steel piece of steel, but I guess it works well enough. And you can also see some Sharpie marker marks that I've made on the bottom of the circuit board when I was tracing the circuit out. So here's a better view of the bottom of the circuit board. It's a single-sided board with um, silk screen, and it's using the philosophy of making the foils as wide as possible and just having very narrow gaps between the uh, the foils. I don't think that's really a very great practice for audio equipment. Uh, I think it would be better if they did it the other way around. It's almost like they routed the circuit board pattern rather than uh, you know etched it, but it, it does in fact appear to be etched. Uh, the downside to doing it this way, or one of the downsides, is that some of the foils are really huge and it's hard to get the solder uh, warm enough to flow properly. And here's just another view of the top of the circuit board and especially showing the sub-circuit board with the aux connector on it and its little five-pin ribbon cable. Also the LED uh, which is used to indicate power is kind of just up on its own leads and in fact, to keep it from getting dislodged, it's held in with a, a blob of some sort of a gliptol-like uh, tacky glue, which I had to break free uh, to get the board out. And here's just another view um, of the same thing, just flipped the other way around. I should mention that the threaded bushing on the volume control does not thread into the chassis at all. So there's no support for that. The only support that component has is the uh, metal bracket at its rear end which is soldered into a couple of holes. That and of course the uh, two leads for the power switch and the six leads for the two uh, parallel potentiometers. And here's just a view of the circuit board, looking at it more straight on from the front. Doesn't really show anything new. And similarly, here's an edge-on view from the rear. Here you can see the two white protuberances above the RCA jack, which are actually blocks um, where the left and the right are all part of the same jack assembly, 
and those white protuberances are or you can put a screw in through the rear panel of the chassis to help anchor those in place so they don't put all of the uh, connection strain on the circuit board pins. Okay, here's my redrawn schematic. So I've identified this as the variously branded TEC, TCC, or JEC. And the only model number I've seen for this is TC-780LC, regardless of the branding. Although not all of the branded versions of this use that number anywhere on the product, although usually it's in the sales documentation or the sales listing. Anyway, so I'll start out with the power supply. And this does have some weird stuff about it. I got this schematic by tracing out the circuit board foils and where it looked weird I double and triple checked it to make sure and then even went in with a continuity checker and make sure I wasn't you know crossing my eyes or something. So they're using a common trick to get a bipolar power supply which is what you usually want when you're amplifying AC signals with an op amp. Uh, you'll want some voltage above uh, what you're calling ground or circuit common and some voltage below it so that the voltage can swing above and below ground. So we start out with a 12 volt power jack that comes in from the AC wall adapter and depending on the brand of these things and when it was made and who sold it, very, you know, variables there, you'll get different power packs used with this what's otherwise apparently the same product. Um, in reality the power consumption of this thing comes down to, to three things. One is how much power does the op amp use and that can be determined from its data sheet. How much power does the LED dissipate or its, its resistor um, and or more specifically in this case how much current does it take to run the LED and then finally uh, how much power or how much current is put out by the op amp to drive the load which is not part of the data sheet because they have no idea what your your load is going to be so I looked up the typical impedance ranges of various uh, RCA line level equipment and those were all usually quite high um, you know well over 10k uh, often 20k you know very high negligible in this case the amount of current you're gonna pump into that from this is so low as you could just disregard it uh, then you also have to figure out the attenuator here which is you know about uh, 11k to ground although it varies somewhat depending on the frequency due to these other things in here so that's still pretty low um, and when I did the math you could say that the output loading is not significant on uh, how much current you need from the power supply the major things are the op amp itself and the the LED with a 12 volt power source and dropped by 0.6 volts through this diode and with this 10k resistor here and a typical uh, voltage drop across a red LED it comes to about 1 milliamp going through this load path. The maximum worst case uh, current required by this op amp is 16 milliamps. Nominally it'll be closer to 8 milliamps so if you take the worst case 16 milliamps add the 1 milliamp here and a negligible uh, amount of current to drive the load uh, you end up with a worst case of about 17 milliamps even the smallest 12 volt wall wart regulated supply you're likely to get will be good for at least 100 milliamps so already you're several times more uh, or there's several times more power being provided than this circuit can use worst case so uh, one of these that I purchased the seller 
says they provided a you know deluxe or uprated power supply it's good for about 320 milliamps which is ludicrous there's no way this circuit can consume anywhere near that even you know with peaks it's it's not like driving into speakers or something there's nothing dynamic that changes with the load on these line level signals that's going to care about peaks and things like that it's it the it of course mathematically it's in there but it's so small it's ridiculous so just to clear that up that you don't need anything particularly fancy for these but it it does count on you having a regulated 12 volt power supply um, then they create a virtual ground or the circuit ground the circuit common that's this point here and on this schematic is denoted with this ground symbol uh, they create that middle point between here and here by having equal value resistors and yes you can factor that into the power required from here even though it's not really dynamic but again it's it's really a tiny amount yeah it's it's something like uh, 0.1 milliamps uh, used by this uh, here just to provide the virtual ground so again compared to the rest of it it's it's a negligible amount even though it's more there than than would be used by the load so again I would say worst case 17 milliamps anyway so you've got this point now through, through this voltage divider which is halfway between here and here and now if you call this the ground and you measure from this remember we've dropped about 0.6 volts here so uh, this point here to here is about 11.4 volts so half of that gives you 5.7 volts from virtual ground to here and 5.7 volts from virtual ground down to here so you can treat this as a plus 5.7 volt supply and you can treat this as a minus 5.7 volt supply again referenced to circuit ground or circuit common now there is the zener diodes in here and at first I was wondering why they were not provided with a series resistance to drop extra voltage if they start conducting but they are 7.7 .7 volt zeners they're not marked that way I had to desolder a couple of them and put it on a, uh, a zener tester and they were actually 7.72 uh, volts I just rounded it to 7.7 .7. so that's already uh, about 2 volts higher than the voltage you would normally get from 5.7 to 7.7 .7. and since this is a regulated supply it should never go high enough for these zeners to start conducting so what these are is their protection for the op amp in case this thing malfunctions or if you plugged in a different power supply uh, than the one that's supposed to be provided with it and it's putting out you know 16 volts or something uh, in that case these zeners would conduct and they would um, prevent the voltage from going too high the other thing that could happen is possibly something could be wrong with these resistors but anyway these are clearly here to provide to prevent voltages above a certain level from reaching the op amp that's the only thing that cares and now you've got some filter caps in here you don't expect any ripple coming in here because this is already a regulated supply so it should be a nice smooth DC voltage but since that supply is in a wall wart and then there's six feet of cable going to this it's good practice to put you know a little bit of capacitance here to uh, help stabilize that at the opposite end of that long resistance which is that uh, the wire from the wall wart power supply and uh, finally there's these small value capacitors 0.1 microfarad disk capacitors and these are useless as far as uh, stabilizing the voltage but they are good to bypass any higher frequency signals that may have been coupled into that oh uh, you know six feet of wire or whatever it is between the power supply and this preamplifier so these capacitors are bypassing those higher frequencies all right let's look at the the bulk of the circuit here it's really the same thing twice 
I have the right channel along the top and the left channel along the bottom. So there are really three ways to get a signal into this with the right and left RCA jacks or with the DIN connector on the back that's associated with the inputs. Uh, it seems like the DIN connector is pretty much gone away from popular use. It used to be big in Europe, especially in the 70s and 80s, but according to various sources, not even the Europeans are putting DIN connectors on things anymore, at least not for um, stereos and so on. Um, nevertheless, this product has them. Um, and then also, instead of going around the rear, you can put in a line-level signal uh, from an auxiliary input on the front, which would commonly come from something like the output of a smartphone or an MP3 player. And those are nominally headphone outputs, but they will work as line level outputs too. Just the level isn't usually ideal. Anyway, it's set up, so let's take a look at the right channel. So the input comes in. It's just electrically in parallel with pin 3, of the DIN connector which is defined by the DIN standard as the right channel input and then similarly the uh, left RCA jack for inputs goes to pin 5 which is defined as being the the uh, left channel uh, input on the DIN plug and then of course ground on pin 2 and these are defined as outputs and they're not used here uh, anyway, so those are electrically uh, common with each other. And then there's these little capacitors to ground 220 picofarads. So those are useless except to shunt high frequencies, you know, things getting up towards radio, you know, radio frequencies and so on. Anything that's picked up by the cable should be shunted to ground because these capacitors, which are transparent, uh, essentially at audio frequencies start having relatively uh, declining resistance values or uh, capacitive reactance values at higher frequencies so they start looking like a short circuit to ground for those higher frequencies but then following for example the right channel around we come down here we go through uh, this connector on the circuit board then over a five conductor ribbon cable to a matching connector on this sub-circuit board which has the um, stereo 8th inch or 3.5 millimeter phone connector which is the same size and type you'd normally see on things like smartphones and mp3 players for their uh, headphone outputs. The uh, sleeve is connected here, the ring is connected here, that's usually defined as the left and then the uh, the tip is over here that's usually defined as the right channel. Uh, so the the incoming signal comes from down up here rather goes through and it goes to the switch contact on the uh, jack. So if you don't have anything plugged in then this guy pushes in this direction and makes contact with this switch contact. Likewise this phone contact is not being pushed in this direction so it's going down and it's hitting this switch contact so the the incoming signal just goes through here and back around and out and then it continues on its merry way but if you plug something in here then it separates the switch contacts from the input contacts and now whatever signal you've got coming in uh, on the right channel would come on this contact, not connect to here, and come through here and go into the amplifier and this part is disconnected and the same thing happens with the other channel. So that's the way that works, but you notice one thing, these capacitors which were deemed to be important are on the wrong side of the switch. They should be over here. Uh, well, maybe they might suppose that you could have a fairly long length of uh, cable coming into these line level inputs 
and that those might be more susceptible to noise pickup because of their length. Therefore they might need these capacitors. Whereas if you're plugging in the output of an MP3 player, you probably have a short little cable, you know, just two or three feet long in many cases, and they might figure out plus well, plus the output circuitry on a headphone amp tends to be lower impedance than the output of a typical uh, line level device. So it might drive the signals a little more assertively, if you will. Uh, anyway, so they may have decided they didn't really need these high frequency shunt capacitors after the aux input switching and they really only wanted them here or it could just be they messed up on the circuit board and they really wanted these to be over here after this aux switch instead of in front of the aux switch. Not sure. I first thought it was a mistake and then I thought well maybe it was deliberate. Anyway, so let's continue through assuming that switch isn't even there. We come in the right channel, high frequencies are shunted to ground, we go through this 4.7k resistor and then into the clockwise side of one of the two gangs of the volume potentiometer. The other one is here for the other channel. This is the front gang, this is the rear gang. Those are two potentiometers essentially on the same knob and same knob shaft and in indeed at the back of those two is another gang which is the power switch. As I noted here it's part of VR1 which is the component designation of the volume pot. So when you have the volume pot turned fully counterclockwise the power switch is open but any other point in the rotation of the volume knob the power switch is closed. And as I already described that's the point when this LED will turn on. So again, it's not really indicating whether the power is on or off so much as it's indicating that there is power and that the volume knob is not turned all the way down. Um, okay, so let's continue on. Then we have a DC blocking capacitor. So it prevents any DC component of the input signal from getting through to the amplifier. It lets only the AC part through. That's very common. And then you have to reference the circuit after that capacitor to ground. So there's always a resistor after the blocking capacitor going to ground and that's what this guy is. Now there is a certain amount of attenuation here. First off, this is a voltage divider and even if the pot is turned fully clockwise, in other words all the way up to full volume, you still lose something in this resistor. And secondly, um, you lose a little bit because even if this pot here is up to here, this still forms a voltage divider. This is, you know, roughly one-tenth of this. So you lose, you know, roughly a tenth of the input signal even if the pot is turned all the way up. Then you also lose a little bit because at audio frequencies this capacitor has some capacitive reactance so it acts like the top half of a voltage divider where this DC reference resistor is the bottom half of the voltage divider so you lose a little bit there too but again at normal audio frequencies this capacitor is low enough that virtually all the voltage coming off of the volume pot is dropped across this resistor. Very little is lost here. Then that's applied to the input of the op amp. The op amp has two, well the op amp package has two op amps in it. Uh, the one with pins 5, 6, and 7 and the other half of pins 1, 2, and 3. And that's the same op amp whose power is up here as we already talked about. This is configured as a normal non-inverting amplifier. So the signal is applied to the plus input and then there's uh, some sort of a resistance between the output and the minus input and a resistance from the minus input to ground. So that's what we have here and here. 
3.6K. I show the extra zero here because these are uh, five banded resistors. So they, instead of specifying only two digits, they'd specify three digits. So they're a higher accuracy resistor. In addition to having uh, a pretty high um, accuracy level, uh, it, I think these are 1% tolerance resistors. And uh, if you just ignore the capacitor here and this capacitor here and only think about this resistor and this resistor, the formula for the gain of this amplifier is this resistance divided by this resistance and the result of that plus one is the gain. Obviously 3.6K is way bigger than 220 ohms so you can get a just a quick back of the napkin idea of the the DC gain of this amplifier. By putting these capacitors around this one and in series with this one it messes with the gain as the frequencies go into the the sub audio range uh, or into the higher than audio range. Uh, for example, this capacitor 330 picofarads at audio frequencies is a very high value and if you put a very high value across a relatively low value like 3.6K it has no effective uh, change to the overall resistance of this so it's as if it isn't even there. And um, again, this resistor doesn't really change this one very much uh, at audio frequencies. So you can treat this for the most part, you know, at least between something like 80 or 100 hertz up until well over 20 kilohertz as being just the DC gain it's only when you get down below maybe 60 hertz or above, I don't know, 50 hertz or something like that where these capacitors start affecting the gain and rolling it off at the high and low ends. So uh, we have that gain there and the attenuation you get here is such that it overwhelms the relatively low gain of this stage so you don't always get a gross amplification you attenuate it a lot and then amplify it back up and depending where the pot is this fixed gain might be more than the attenuation here in which case you have a a, a, uh, a I don't know you call it a net gain or whatever uh, the signal is larger here than it was over here. But on the other hand, if you turn this pot, you know, pretty far to the left of the 12 o'clock position, then the attenuation here is greater than the gain, so you don't make it up and you end up with a smaller signal here than there is here. So that's how this amplifier can either reduce the overall signal or it can boost the overall signal or it can leave it passing through pretty much unchanged. And then we have a similar kind of arrangement here with the capacitors and resistors. We have a DC blocking capacitance on the output. You'd normally have that. If there was any DC that managed to get through here and then that DC got amplified, it could be a substantial DC offset. So you want to strip it out. So usually you do have a capacitor in series. This resistor isn't always there in circuits of this sort, but the capacitor usually is. And then once again, after you do that, you have to reference this point to circuit common or circuit ground. So you have a resistor here, a 10K resistor in this case, 10.0K to ground. Performs the same kind of function as this DC blocking capacitor and reference to ground resistor. Same thing is happening with this capacitor and this resistor. Um, for some reason they chose to put a 1K resistor in here. So you have to figure out what the capacitive reactance is here, add it to this, and that becomes the top half of a voltage divider. And then this is the bottom half of a voltage divider, but 
you have to take into account the capacitive reactance of this guy and put that reactance in parallel with this resistance to get the overall resistance of the bottom half of this voltage divider. And uh, as I already hinted at, you have to take the capacitive reactance of these at whichever frequency you're talking about, add that to this resistor, and then the composite of that is the top half of this voltage divider. So again, depending on the frequency, you're going to have more or less uh, attenuation here. It should be a very small attenuation, but it's going to uh, be affected by the frequency. And uh, then you head on out through the RCA jack, and once again, the, the right signal is connected to pin 3, which the DIN standard defines as the right channel input. And uh, likewise, the left is connected to pin 5, the DIN defined left channel uh, uh, input. So why are we using the input pins here as well as using the inputs here where it makes sense? Well, the DIN standard defines that you should use the input pins when you're coming into a device that's the, the destination of the signal. For example, you might come out of the, the output of a tape deck and go into the input of an amplifier. So you'd always use the output pins of the tape deck and then go through to the input pins of the amplifier uh, and then if this was the end device, then this wouldn't even be here. But because this amplifier is really a pass-through, it's not the ultimate destination when you plug a cable into here, uh, you want it to still be going to the input of something further downstream. That's the only reason I can think of why they did it this way. And I know you could get crossover DIN cables where the output would be um, set up so the output pins are connected at one end and the input pins are connected at the other end. But if you're using a straight through cable, uh, for example, from here to the input of a power amplifier, for example, then it would make sense to be using the input pins here even on the output of this intermediate circuit, if that makes any sense. I have three sets of notes on this drawing, and I'm mentioning all this because uh, this is going to be up in PDF form on my file share site, which I'm referencing in the description and also just on this um, caption on the video, so anybody can download this if they want it. So I've got the general notes that talks about the resistors, their type, their wattage, uh, that they're all set up to have three significant digits, which is more than you usually have. It makes these look more like precision resistors. And um, that's a little bit unusual, but that's the way they did it. And I talk about um, how the voltage is a reference to the virtual ground. And I mentioned that all the component values are based on study of two amps bought a few years apart. Um, and that confirms what I said elsewhere that you know it appears to be a design that was made by more than one factory or perhaps by the same factory but being produced with different brand names on it. Uh, anyway, it's not a new product, and it seems like it's available with a lot of markings and variation in packaging and so on. And I notice that uh, I have a bunch of empirical specifications that are in separate notes, and then I talk about the differences in the branding and the model number and uh, copyright information. Then I've got a section on general observations. Uh, I note here that I think the position of the power switch is in error and it disagrees with the packaging on the, the two of them that I received where it specifically says that the power switch turns on the power to the amplifier and we've seen that it doesn't actually do that.
So I just clarify that I did, did triple check this and also did voltage measurements to confirm it. And I talk about what I already mentioned in this video that the two high frequency shunt capacitors on the inputs are only in effect if you're using the RCA or DIN jacks, not if you're using the AUX slash MP3 jack. And I talk about how the volume pot is really two pots and a power switch sharing a shaft and a knob and that I thought the stated value of 42k was kind of an odd value so I actually desoldered one of the pots from the board and measured directly without the possibility of anything else on the circuit board influencing the resistance measurement and it was 42k um, and I talk about how, how the, the small value capacitors are either being used for high frequency shunts or to provide a high frequency roll off to the gain. Um, and I talked about what I already mentioned about this being a pass through device, so that probably explains why they use certain pins on the DIN connectors. And then I talked about how they made a mistake on the silk screen on the back of the units in regards to how the aux. Uh, jack works. Finally, on the empirical specifications note, I talk about how the the specifications, when you can find them, seem to be kind of spurious or specious uh, and just generally unreliable and often are not provided at all. And that because I didn't find them reliable, I took my own measurements as specified below. And then I have a whole thing talking about the power supply and how some of the stated claims of sellers that a 300 milliamp supply helps that things sound better, which I talk about why that's nonsensical. And then I talk about the actual measurements I did, what type of waveform and what level. I used 0.5 volts peak-to-peak -peak sine wave as the input for my empirical tests. And I talked about uh, the gain uh, at the 12 o'clock position and at full clockwise position. Then I talked about the frequency response at various uh, different frequencies and what that meant to the signal being attenuated. And then once again I uh, talk a little bit more about how because these do seem to have been made over a period of time and possibly by different manufacturers that there could be examples out there that while the circuit board and everything may be identical they may have used somewhat different component values which would possibly throw my specifications here into a state of being less than accurate um, in some instances. All right just for yucks I decided to see if circuit theory would support my empirical frequency response and gain measurements. So uh, first off I picked four arbitrary frequencies 20 Hertz, 100 Hertz, 1 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz. The 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz being the normally referenced range of audio frequencies and then the others just being intermediate values. So I ran the numbers for this attenuation network both this and this and uh, worked out that the attenuation at all frequencies between 20 Hertz and 20 kilohertz uh, and with the knob turned all the way up gives you approximately 0.95 uh, it's a it's a ratio um, so whatever voltage you have in here, you'd multiply it times 0.95 to get the voltage coming out of this network. So again, a very slight attenuation due to all this stuff. It only starts getting to be worse than 0.95 when you get into lower frequencies or higher frequencies outside of the normal audio range. And then uh, I ran the capacitive reactances here and here at those four frequencies and then 
did the parallel resistance calculation here to figure out what the total feedback resistance was and the series combination here for this resistance and then did the normal uh, formula for the uh, gain of a non-inverting amplifier and I came out with uh, a gain of this stage at 20 Hertz it was 10.9 at 100 Hertz it was 13.3 at 1 or 1 kilohertz it's 15.7 at 20 kilohertz it's 15.2 so um, it's definitely best between 1 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz and then you have some roll off on the lower frequencies and even though the printed specifications when you can find them for this makes it sound like the uh, frequency response between 20 Hertz and 20 kilohertz is only like you know 0.5 or something like whatever it was a pretty small change the empirical observations make it look like it's worse than that uh, now again these are raw gain values and I think the other specifications were in DB so it's not a linear relationship and these this decrease here in particular doesn't look so bad when you convert it into decibels and then finally I had to do a similar set of calculations here figure out the uh, reactances here and what those would be in parallel the reactants here and what that is in parallel with this and then treat this whole thing like a voltage divider and uh, you have a factor or a ratio of 0.85 at 20 Hertz 0.9 at 100 Hertz and 1 kilohertz and 0.87 essentially 0.9 at uh, 20 kilohertz. So if you add all those things up, you end up with, um, and again this is all assuming that the volume knob is turned all the way up. You have a, um, at 20 hertz you have a, a gain of uh, 8.74. Uh, at 100 hertz 11.4. At 1 kilohertz 13.4 and then it drops a little bit at 20 kilohertz 12.5 if you convert those into db at 20 hertz it's an 18.8 .8 db gain at 100 hertz it's 21.1 db at um, uh, 1 kilohertz this was 100 hertz at 1 kilohertz it's 22.5 which agrees with the uh, stated spec that I found that said 22 dB maximum gain so that seems to match pretty closely and then at uh, 20 kilohertz it's it's right at 22 dB so that seems to support the empirical measurements matching the circuit theory